This jury has the blood of my brother on their hands. Who's taking a rap for this? But who's taking a rap for the dead child? This is a special presentation of the Courtroom Television Network and New York One News. The Crown Heights verdict, a city tour. Now, from New York, here's Greg Jarrett. Welcome. For the first time on television, the jurors in the notorious Crown Heights murder trial will speak out. We'll hear how they reached their controversial verdict and why. The jurors still fear for their safety some four weeks after the verdict. They have asked that their faces be concealed. Now, we are fortunate enough to have with us Mr. Arthur Lewis, who successfully defended Lemrick Nelson. Also, the presiding judge in the case has joined us, the Honorable Edward Rappaport. And via satellite, later on in the show, Norman Rosenbaum, the brother of Yankel Rosenbaum, the victim in this case. The Brooklyn District Attorney's Office declined our invitation. One word of caution. This was a seven-week trial. We have just 90 minutes here. And while we have tried to be fair in selecting portions of the trial that you'll hear, well, the jurors are the ones who saw and heard all of the evidence. Before we begin, let me ask this question to juror number six, one of our jurors with us tonight. Why have you decided to come forward at this time to talk about your verdict? Uh, basically, the city has been torn apart by our verdict. The the city needs to start healing now. The press has only printed certain things which haven't nearly even been half of what we thought, what we heard, what we saw. It needs to be told in order to start the healing process and the truth needs to come to light. Juror number six, let me be very upfront at the top of our show here about this next question. Some people have suggested that this was a racist verdict. Was this jury ever divided along racial lines? No. Race never played a part in any of our deliberations. Uh, we couldn't have been racially biased in any way because we had over 150 jurors uh, interviewed for this case. We were gone through one by one. The prosecution, the judge, and the defense had a yes or no on each and every one of us. And we were all chosen individually for this particular case. We were sworn as jurors to take the law, the facts, and the evidence provided to us and come to a verdict, which is exactly what happened. And, and as a follow-up to that, isn't it true, it's our understanding, maybe you can confirm this, that it was a white jury that was a juror that was on the a panel who was the most insistent, or at least insistent, from the very beginning for acquittal? I wouldn't say most insistent, but it is true that one of the white jurors was uh, for the innocent verdict from the beginning. All right. Well, it looked like an open and shut case, but once all of the evidence was opened up, jurors could not shut out the gnawing doubts they had about Lemrick Nelson's guilt. Court TV's Peter Thorne has more. The fourth person, please rise. The verdict is supposed Dom, to be the can you conclusion hear of a case, but in the murder trial of Lemrick Nelson, the jury's decision has ignited new hostility, dividing the people of New York City. Right. We, we want justice! We a want Jew justice. was justice. killed! One drop of a Jew's blood should never be shed! Riots followed the jury's decision to acquit Limerick Nelson in the stabbing death of Yankel Rosenbaum. Under the first count of the indictment, charging the defendant Limerick Nelson under indictment 10358 of 1991 with the crime of murder in the second degree intentional. What is your verdict? Not guilty. This case begins on August 19, 1991, when the last car in a motorcade for the leader of the Lubavitch sect of the Hasidic Jewish community lost control. That car veered off the road, jumped onto the sidewalk, killing seven-year-old Gavin Cato. According to a report by the Crown Heights Coalition, one of the first ambulances to arrive at the scene was owned by a Jewish volunteer organization. At the instruction of the police, the ambulance left with the Jewish driver of the car involved in the accident, leaving Gavin Cato to the care of other emergency workers. A group of African Americans gathered at the accident site, and as the tension grew, some began to riot through the streets of Crown Heights. 29-year-old Yankel Rosenbaum, an Australian citizen studying in the United States, found himself surrounded at this intersection. In apparent retaliation for Cato's death, Rosenbaum was stabbed to death. Police arrested Limerick Nelson for the fatal stabbing of Rosenbaum. 
According to the police, Nelson was running from the stabbing site. They found a bloody knife in his pocket, and he later confessed to the stabbing. Fourteen months after the stabbing, the jury found Limerick Nelson not guilty of second-degree murder. In the weeks following this verdict, much has been written about the jury's decision, and even more has been said. New York City Mayor David Dinkins has been blasted for not taking a stronger role in the initial investigation. The Justice Department has initiated a new investigation into the stabbing death, and city council members almost came to physical blows, arguing whether the jury deserved to be condemned. As the controversy continues over the jury's verdict, New York City continues to be a city torn. Peter Thorne, Court TV. Now to the trial itself. We begin with the opening statement of Prosecutor Sari Kolach. From the outset, she blamed the murder on racism, anti-Semitism. Yanko Rosenbaum was brutally stabbed to death, not because of something he did, but because of what he was, a Jew. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On August 19, 1991, after cries of let's get a Jew, Yanko Rosenbaum was attacked and stabbed by a violent and angry mob in the Crown Heights section of Brooklyn. During the course of this trial, ladies and gentlemen, we expect the evidence to show beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, Lemmerk Nelson, having gotten caught up in the frenzy of what was going on, joined in with that mob and stabbed Yanko Rosenbaum to death. We expect the evidence to show that the defendant's conduct in acting together with that mob constituted nothing less than murder. At 8.30 p.m. on the night of August 19, 1991, there was a tragic and fatal car accident at the corner of Utica Avenue and President Street in Crown Heights. The driver of the car involved in that accident was a Hasidic Jew. The victims were two young black children, one of whom was killed. Immediately after the car accident, protests broke out on the corner of Utica and President. Amid the cries of no justice, no peace, were also the cries of let's get a Jew, kill the Jews. A group of about 75 to 100 people began moving west on President Street, breaking windows, flipping over cars. The defendant and the group of about 10 to 20 people ended up at the corner of Brooklyn and President. There, the defendant saw someone say, there's a Jew, let's get that Jew. The evidence will show, ladies and gentlemen, that the Jew that the defendant and that crowd saw that night was none other than the Australian tourist, Yanko Rosenbaum. The crowd chased Mr. Rosenbaum, caught him on the corner, and began attacking him. You're going to hear, ladies and gentlemen, through the defendant's own statement that he joined in with that violent mob that was beating mm -hmm. Yanko Rosenbaum. Not because he was angered or outraged by the earlier car accident. <coughs> Not because Mr. Rosenbaum was Jewish. But because at that moment, on that night, on that corner, Lemrick Nelson got caught up in the excitement of what was going on. He got caught up in the frenzy of that moment. And he joined in with that violent crowd, and he took out a knife, and he stabbed Mr. Rosenbaum. For the defense, Arthur Lewis wasted no time in placing the blame on somebody other than Lemrick Nelson. In his opening statement, Mr. Lewis blames police, accusing them of fabricating evidence and lying. The issue in this case is whether or not my client, Lemrick Nelson, killed Yanko Rosenbaum. The evidence will show that there are other people who are responsible for the death of Yanko Rosenbaum. And that the police framed my client. The evidence will show that there's no question that Yanko Rosenbaum sacrificed his life on the evening of August 19th. <coughs> Yanko Rosenbaum a religious scholar, and perhaps a modern-day Renaissance man, in all reality had a purpose for being out on the street that day. The question has to be asked and answered, what was he doing? Why was he there? We believe the evidence will show that Yankel Rosenbaum 
was on the streets of Crown Heights that day, on that occasion, attempting to protect his house of worship from being vandalized and perhaps intruded upon by hoodlums, street thugs, and those types that would cause mayhem given an opportunity. All I ask of you, ladies and gentlemen, at this point, is to wait till all the facts are Wait till you hear all the evidence. And I am certain that once you've heard all the evidence, that my client will be set free, will term him as a victim, and all I want is some justice. Now, Mr. Lewis, when, when you said, quote, the question has to be asked and answered, what was uh, Yankel Rosenbaum doing there? Why was he there? What, what did you mean by that? Were you somehow suggesting perhaps that he played a role in his own death? That's a very interesting question. What do you mean, did he play a role in his own death? Was he doing something out there that he shouldn't have been doing? Were you suggesting by that or that he shouldn't have been out there? I mean, after all, he lived out in that area. Well, the question again is very interesting. I don't suggest he's a citizen, or certainly at that point he was a guest in our city. He has every right to enjoy all the freedoms that the, that's reasonable under the circumstances. What I suggested is that the question had to be asked and answered. What was he doing at that particular vicinity at the time prior to the encounter with this group? Well, you asked the question in such a way that it seemed as though you knew the answer and that you were going to introduce evidence of some sort that would demonstrate the answer. That perhaps he shouldn't have been out there. That perhaps he was trying to cause an insightful situation. The third time you're asking questions that I find interesting. Uh, listen, in my opening, I made myself clear that Mr. Yanko Rosenbaum had every right to be out there. And as my belief, that he was there on a security mission. And if that's so... Well, what do you mean if, security can mission? Can I finish, sir, please? Go ahead. If that's so, he had absolutely every right to be out there. And let me make myself clear from the offset, Mr. Jarrett. No one, and certainly not Yanko Rosenbaum, need sacrifice his life, either under these circumstances that uh, we're faced with, or any other. Let me make myself quite clear about this. He could not have provoked his own death. Well, that's Unless, what I'm getting at. Well, let, Thanks. Me make, let me answer it quite clearly to you, all right? Uh, he was killed. He shouldn't have been killed. And we still have to concern ourselves with getting those people who are responsible for his death. Okay. When we come back, how the bloody knife was allegedly found on the accused Lemrick Nelson. We want to ask several questions of the jurors about the opening statements that were made in this particular case. Uh, juror number 12, let me ask you this. Were you at all swayed by what was said, either by Mr. Lewis or by the prosecutor in their opening statements? No, I not hearing anything. Hello, juror, juror number 12, can you hear me? No, I cannot. Can you I hear can me hear now? you now, yes. Uh, uh, were you at all swayed by anything that was said in the opening statement by the prosecutor or by the defense attorney, Arthur Lewis? Uh, no, I wasn't. That's not evidence. Mrs. Kolach, or Ms. Kolach said that uh, the defense, you, that we would hear the defense admit to such and such. This did not happen in the case. Mr. Just as Mr. Lewis said, why was uh, Yankul Rosenbaum there? That's not evidence. So, you know, that gave no credence as, as far as I'm concerned. Well, you and I didn't think anyone else. We were looking for evidence. Yeah. What about when Mr. Lewis said, my client was framed by police? Did you then so look we, for that kind of evidence when, it, uh, when the case was put on? We were looking for evidence. I mean, you don't look for specifically even though they set the case up for you to look for these things you don't look for them you wait and see what develops 
you know, I'm not expecting it. And at, at the end of the case, after all the testimony and evidence has been presented, you come to a conclusion, not based on what, you know, the uh, opening statement or the closing statement. Yeah. You look and see what evidence has, pre has been presented, what's conflicting, what you have to eliminate. And that's how you come to a, a conclusion. And, and juror number sure. two, very, very quickly, I mean, after all, the opening statement, the prosecutor stands up and says, you, we have the bloody knife, the murder weapon. We have a confession from Lemerick Nelson. And we also have the word of the victim, who is no longer here, uh, who picked out his killer before he died. Did you think that was a pretty strong case from the outset? You listen, yes, and you wait to hear, for, hear this substantiation. If you don't hear the substantiation or the, uh, the contradiction, then you listen for contradictions. You listen to see exactly what happened. There, you know, it wasn't as simple as that. If it was as simple as that, we, I suppose we wouldn't be here. Or we, you know, it would be the other side that would be asking us to give our statement. Judge Rappaport, let me turn to you for a moment. You, you came under a great deal of harsh criticism from the Village Voice and others. I'm looking at uh, right here the, the title, New, York, New York's Ten Worst Judges, a recent issue uh, by the Village Voice. We also criticized you now and again here at Court TV uh, for, for the way that uh, you presided over the case, some of the harsh exchanges, some of the angry exchanges that took place between you and the gentleman who's now sitting next to you. Uh, we know you wanted to respond. What... Uh, what would you like to say? Well, when you say when you say I wanted to respond, it's difficult to respond in a vacuum to many of the things that took place during this trial. I, I imagine that the uh, the article that was in the Village Voice is something that should be mentioned. Firstly, the article which started last May, well before the Nelson trial, was investigated by this reporter. It was unclear at that time what he was going to write about. It seems that he called many different people. He spoke to the district attorney, Joe Hines. He spoke to the administrative judge of our county. He spoke to the head of the Legal Aid Society. He spoke to the head of different bar associations. And what they were telling him was contrary to what he ended up writing about. As a matter of fact, he was told by these various people the head of the Brooklyn Bar and the Kings County Criminal Bar and the judge and Joe Hines, that by my experience and reputation, that his criticism of me being one of the ten worst judges was not properly placed. But of course, everybody has an opinion. But what was interesting about the article, when it came out, he never spoke about my qualifications as a judge. He didn't speak about... No, instead he spoke about how you were a pro police because you had once represented police unions and they well, said he, that he you also were handling cases in a right. way that was very sympathetic to police officers who were being either acquitted or pleading out or in one particular case served no time. All right. Maybe we should address ourselves to that. Firstly, he indicated in the article that I, prior to taking the bench on January 1st, 1990, was the uh, counsel to the PBA. Well, that, of course, is correct, but not correct. I was the counsel to the PBA in 1976, 14 years before I took the bench. It's interesting, my term is only 14 years, and he didn't take that into consideration. Then he says I am the best pal that the police have on the bench. Yeah, that's really the focus I, of the article. Is it a, true? Right. I don't think that's true at all. As a matter of fact, there's a detective right now who thinks I'm the worst ogre of any judge sitting on the bench because... Uh, I've ordered him to be in my courtroom tomorrow to continue to give testimony, and he would rather be somewhere else. But that's not really the hallmark. So of it's an unfair, unfair rap that you're getting here. Well, I'm, I'm not here to be confrontational with you or with the program. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is he talks about five cases. One of the cases he talks about is a case in which he says a police officer was found not guilty. He neglected in his article to say found not guilty by a jury. I want to move and it back to Crown if, Heights and maybe we can pick well, up. Well, right, I'm, I'm going to address on. it if I can just finish my thought. I know you want to get back. Go ahead. But, you know, we have a rule, which uh, Mr. Lewis is aware of, and I'm sure you are as an attorney, that you never impeach a jury's verdict. Of course, that is more significant when we talk about convictions. Mm -hmm. If there's a conviction, we don't permit lawyers afterwards 
to get affidavits from the jurors and say we changed our mind and so forth. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is academic in acquittals, but it should be the same thing, just like it would be improper, and I wouldn't sit here and question for one moment the verdict in Crown Heights. The verdict that he talks about in the police case was a jury trial. I want to get back to Crown Heights. One sure. of the keys to this case is the murder weapon, a bloody knife that was found in the pocket of Lemerick Nelson. The prosecution calls to the witness stand Mark Hoppe. He is the police officer who made the arrest. First of all, when you came up, uh, when you took a few steps forward, was Mr. Nelson facing you or was his back towards you? His back was to him. And when you said you, you put your hand on him, I'm sorry. I put my that? hands on his shoulders. All right. And describe for us what you did. Did you say anything? No, I, I, I said at first, don't move. All right. Then what'd you do? Then I grabbed him. And what'd you do? I pulled him slightly towards myself and turned him to my right. What'd you do with and him when you turned him to your right? I placed him flat on the ground. Why? I couldn't see his hands, and for my personal safety, I felt it uh, warranted. And after you placed him on the ground, what'd you do? I began to frisk him. What sort of frisk did you do? It's a pat-down frisk, we call it. We slide our hands and pat down. Do you, when you do this frisk, do you enter, put your hands in his clothing at all? Not unless you feel something that you should go in. And did you feel anything? Yes, I did. What did you feel? A uh, hard, narrow object. Where? where? In, his, in his right front pants pocket. What did you think it was? I thought it was a knife. And what did you do? I went into his pocket. And did you recover anything? Yes, I did. What did you recover? A knife. Can you describe the knife for us? A black-handled folding knife, which appeared to be stained with blood. Where did you see what you thought was blood? On a portion of the blade that was visible when it was closed. When the knife was closed, a portion of the blade was visible? Yes. Did when you know what was visible? Blade, a portion of the blade. Did you note anything else about the knife? Yes. What else? It had the word killer written in red, uh, like red paint. Where was the word written? On the handle. Well, that isn't all. Officer Hoppy then takes Lemerick Nelson over to Yankel Rosenbaum, who is lying on the hood of a car, bleeding from stab wounds and a severe beating. What happened when you arrived at the scene, when you came to that corner with uh, Lemmerich Nelson? I walked in front of uh, Mr. Rosenbaum with Mr. Nelson. And what did you do? What happened? I observed Mr. Rosenbaum attempt to uh, get up on his elbows. He looked directly at Mr. Nelson and said, why did you stab me? We want to go to our jurors now. Juror number six. Did you believe the knife was found in Lemerick Nelson's pocket? Did it seem possible to you that perhaps Officer Hoppy was simply lying about that? I wouldn't use the word lying. Lying is a very strong word. Uh, it could have come from his pocket. It possibly couldn't have come from his pocket. There's nothing concrete other than Hoppy's word that it came from his pocket, whereas you have Officer Lewis who's saying he didn't see it come directly out of his pocket, but rather in the general direction of the right-hand pocket. Controversy swirled around the murder weapon, and if you believe it was pulled from the pocket of Lemerick Nelson, was it then mishandled by police? Defense attorney Arthur Lewis cross-examines Officer Hoppy about that. Well, what did you do with this bloody knife? Next. I showed it to my partner. Did you hold it up to him? Yes, I did. And what did you do with it after that? I placed it in my right rear pocket. You put this bloody knife in your right rear pocket? Yes, I did. Did you have any gloves? No, I did not. Did you get any blood on your hands? Not to my knowledge. A brown paper bag containing three dollars and a knife. These three dollar bills were commingled with this bloody knife? Yes. Didn't you feel it was proper to separate each item? Not at that time. At any time? The vouchering officer would take care of all those uh, details. Well, if these are bloody, wouldn't it destroy the integrity of the physical evidence to put it in with each other, assuming there was blood on this knife? If there was blood on the knife and blood on the dollar bills, I didn't deem it necessary to separate them. Well, that's your testimony. When we come back, we'll talk with Norman Rosenbaum, the brother of the victim.
Rosenbaum, the brother of the victim. Uh, Rosenbaum is a citizen of Australia. He is also a lawyer there, and he has remained in New York for many months since his brother's death. He has become somewhat of a crusader, trying to find justice in the wake of his brother's murder. Mr. Rosenbaum, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. You obviously disagree with the verdict in this case. Tell me why Lemrick Nelson should have been convicted. Well, from where I analyzed the evidence, I saw the evidence was overwhelming and irrefutable. First and foremost, I saw the identification by my brother as told not only by the police, but by the EMS officers, together with the um, members of the community, identif identified Lemrick Nelson, and it showed clearly that he was able to differentiate Lemrick Nelson from other people. I've got a... I've got a um, uh, go, go right ahead if you would, Norman, though. Sorry. Um, the other thing which I found was not only was Yanko's capacity to differentiate clearly, he was lucid, he was awake, he was alert. Coupled also, we have the... Um, apprehension, the admission that Lemrick Nelson was there, that was a point which con was conceded by his counsel, not only that he was there at the um, location, but he was part of the group which attacked Yankel. A he as to the first part, and you know your brother very, very well, and I acknowledge that, certainly, but uh, there were other people who were there, out at the scene, who described this identification by your brother, and you were not there at that moment. Isn't it possible that he could have been mistaken, after all, he identified another suspect that was brought before him, Cleon Taylor, and yet Taylor was let go by police because there wasn't any evidence. Well, I think you have to view Cleon Taylor in this version. Yankel identified him as being there. That doesn't mean that he wasn't there. What, they, what was lacking was other evidence which would satisfy the prosecuting authorities. Cleon Taylor was arrested. That arrest was voided. I think the question was to why he was avoided is best left to the DA, but it was put to me that it was on the basis there wasn't other evidence. It doesn't suggest that Yankel's identification was any, in any way deficient. What we have here in the case of um, Lemrick Nelson, Yankel was able to differentiate between other people. We have the testimony of John Anderson who said that he was there with a red shirt. When he was presented to Yankel, he uh, Yankel said he wasn't involved. The presence of the red shirt did not in any way um, overtake Yankel's judgment. When um, Lemrick Nelson was presented, we have the testimony of the EMS officer. Um, in particular, there's a person whose um, independence in the whole situation, I believe, is beyond reproach. Well, given yeah. all of that and a very, very compelling uh, identification by your brother before he died, why then, in your mind, do you think these jurors acquitted Lemrick Nelson? Well, put as diplomatically as I can, I don't believe that the jurors have properly evaluated all the evidence was, which was presented to them. Because, and this is the difficulty which I have, the jurors say they don't, the new, I've only seen comments of the jurors as they appear in the newspaper. I haven't had the opportunity this evening of hearing their comments. comments. But the fact is, in the newspaper comments, they made, the com they made reference to the fact that it was the police testimony which they um, had difficulty with. Notwithstanding the police testimony, there was other independent testimony. As I said, we have the um, EMS officer, members of the community, John Anderson, who I should add are all defence witnesses, together with the forensic evidence, together with the psychological evidence which was presented. I believe when you take a look at that, plus the fact that the, what the jurors did in disregarding the entirety of the police evidence, not just one part of a, an officer's testimony, but all parts of every officer's testimony, that was what was put in the papers, um, indeed, to me, they haven't been able to properly assess as they were charged to do by the judge in this case. Yeah. Very quickly, any reasons other than the evidence why these jurors in your mind decided to acquit? Well, I suppose what goes through everybody's mind is the so-called social conditioning and people have made reference to the fact were these jurors either consciously or subconsciously concerned about, as we saw in the Rodney King verdict, the suggestion from jurors there that had they known of the repercussions, they would have not found the way they did. Yeah. Were they in any way consciously or subconsciously concerned about their um, safety, the ramifications of their verdict? Were they in any way concerned about the um, fact that if they were to decide in one way, there could have been ramifications which they would not have been responsible for, 
either to themselves personally or to other members or other parts of the community. Norman Rosenbaum, thank you so much for being with us tonight, and our heart goes out to you and your family. We appreciate your being with us. Thank you very much. To the jurors, uh, now I know that you have heard uh, hopefully all of what Norman Rosenbaum had to say. What's your response to, uh, to his opinion that perhaps your decision was based on something other than the evidence? Juror number six. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, correct Norman Rosenbaum. Uh, Go right ahead. As far as what the newspapers print, we have been misquoted. They have put words into our mouth that never came forth with from us at all. Such as? Um, like the, like um, We no. never said that the cops lied, lied, first of all. That's what the newspapers wrote. You cannot believe everything you see in the newspapers. Can I put it a, a different way? Did you not believe the police officers who testified? As a matter of fact, our verdict was based in part upon police testimony. We took Officer Lewis, I mean, we took all of the officers seriously mm -hmm. as far as the testimony was concerned because that's what we were charged to do. We weren't charged to throw apart this way because this particular person's testimony because it didn't sound right to us. Or whatever. We had to take each and every part of what everyone said and take it seriously. We're going to see more of the uh, police officers in just a moment. I'll ask you to hang on and we'll pick up on that in just a moment. Much of this case against Lemrick Nelson based simply on the credibility of the police officers. Transit Authority Officer Robert Lewis tells a very different story about the arrest from that of Officer Hoppy, and nobody is more surprised than Judge Rappaport. What's the very next thing that you did? So we picked the uh, defendant up and we searched him. All right. Did both of you search him? Yes, we did. Both you and Officer? Both searched. Both searched. And during this search, uh, was anything recovered? Yeah, a knife. All right. Who recovered the knife? Officer Hoppy. All right. And do you recall where he recovered this knife from? In his right, right front pocket. Whose right front pocket? The defendant, I'm sorry. Let me ask you this, officer. Once that knife was recovered by Officer Hoppy, what was done next with regard to that knife? Officer Hoppy gave me the knife. I opened the knife. Yeah, and what if he... Wait a second. Slow up. Hoppy handed you the knife? Yeah. And what did you do? You opened it up? Yeah, I opened it up. Can you describe... How you opened up the knife? By the fingertips of the blade. Did you notice anything about it then? Yes, I did. What? It was, uh, it was rusty and it appears to be some blood that was on it. All right. And what did you do next? I looked at it, turned it over, and it had killer right in red. Then I... Where on the knife? On the handle. All right. What did you do with the knife, if anything, after that? I looked at it, and I gave it to my partner on the other side of the fence. You gave it to your partner? No, I, I handed him, yes. I said you gave it to yeah. your partner, meaning Will. Yeah. How is it that you handed him the knife? I had it handed by the tip of the, of, of the blade. Was it still open at that time? Yes, it was. It was still open. All right. And what, if anything, did your partner that you could see do with the knife? He looked at it, he examined it, and he also found the word killer on the handle. What was done then? He gave it back to me, and I gave it back to Officer Hoppy. And what, if anything, did Officer Hoppy do with the knife at that point? He closed it up and put it in his rear pocket. Now, let me ask you, I just want to know where everybody's position. While all this is going on, where Hoppy hands you the knife, you open it up, hand it then to uh, police officer Whaler, you, you and Hoppy are in the yard together? Yes, sir. I would assume that police officer Hoppy was looking at you when he handed you the oh, knife. Oh, yeah, yes he did. I mean, he didn't do it like that. Uh, no, no, we was right side by side. Sir. And then you handed it to police officer Whaler. Where was he standing? On the opposite, uh, on the opposite side of the fence. And he took possession of this knife? Yeah. And then he handed it back to you? You were still in the garden? Yes, sir. And then you handed it to Hoppy? Yes. Where was the defendant while all this was going on? He was, he was still on the ground. Now, there's another officer whose name you now know, right? Police officer Marino? Yeah, he was on the other side of the fence with Officer Wheeler. How close was he to Wheeler while this was happening? We was all right there, Judge. The four of them. Right there. Continue. Now, at that I'll tell you this. 
the court wants Hoppy and and uh, Marino back here on Monday. You follow me? I want them back. And let them. Well, we'll deal with Litman. We have Litman back too. I I want to. This is very bad. Now, Judge, I have to ask you this question. With all respect, you. You said that's incredible. In other words, not believable, not credible. No, aren't you, aren't you sending a clear believe, message to these not jurors at all. that you don't believe these officers who are testifying? Not at all. First of all, I guess it's an example of where we should have a computer doing the trial instead of a human being. It's obvious that the testimony that we just heard, police officer Lewis, was something that caused me to react and use the word that's incredible. I didn't use the word incredulous, which, of course, I guess I'm getting rather subtle, that it's unbelievable, but just it was incredible without some explanation to explain it, the difference between Hoppy's testimony and Lewis. But there were similarities as well. One of the similarities, obviously, was we heard clearly now that Officer Lewis said that he saw Hoppy take it from his right pocket, not from there, his right pocket. Well, however, but, but is it proper I don't for a judge? To, to really make a comment like that? No, it's not, it's not a question of proper conduct. If I did it with thought, that was if I had sat there and if I had said... You wouldn't do it again. I wouldn't do it. It's something that certainly after it happened, right after it happened, which I can't pull back the words and say, I wish I didn't say it, or, but I did very carefully, both at the beginning of the trial, which we haven't seen here tonight and you never showed when I gave my preliminary instructions, I spoke about the judge's role. Mm -hmm. And I also, when I charged the jury, also something that was not shown. And I'm sure they were listening. And as a matter of fact, well, let's, let's, go, ask to them if they let's go to juror number 12 right now. D okay. Did you, did it occur to you, did you catch it, and did you look for it thereafter that the judge was, by virtue of his comments and his order, to bring back these officers in again to testify? Did that at all influence you? Did that influence me as far as testimony is concerned? Yes. Well, first of all, uh, you have the evidence that these officers, especially the four officers, were testifying in conjunction that there was no blood on their hands. They didn't remember the transit officers. Uh, they didn't remember that Yankel Rosenbaum spit on Limerick Nelson. They didn't remember that the knife was given by Hoppy to Sergeant Wilson. I mean, they basically uh, wiped out their own testimony. I mean, that's what I remember. Uh, they had pictures there that were in black and white of a, of, a, uh, uh, of, a, of the knife, which should have been in color. Everything else was in color. Y you know, you have so many things. And I listened to what Mr. Rosenbaum said. He was there the first two days of testimony and the last uh, two days of testimony. And uh, I what want about to know the, how is it that he did saying? not, you know, he's suggesting, you know, that uh, my sympathies are, sympathies are with him. but. He's suggesting that we came to a conclusion. We based our, our opinion on the evidence and the law, and that's it. If there was something else that they wanted us to base it on, they should have let us know. That's, we, use the, uh, we use exclusively those, those, uh, that, those criteria. Okay? Right. That's what Fair, we did. Fair enough. And there Fair was enough. nothing else there. There was, you know, we had to, we also sat there and we spoke and we, uh, we uh, tried to eliminate the fact that these were, you know, what these people were, and we did it. We saw them as two individuals. This is what happened on this night. We were not, uh, we, you know, we wanted to be fair to everybody to make sure justice was served and that the law was served. And that's exactly what we did. Fair comment. When we come back, was this a fair identification? that uh, Yanko Rosenbaum made before he died of his killer. back our retrospective look at the Crown Heights verdict. We have several jurors with us and uh, you may have noticed that their identity is disguised. And let me pick up on that. Juror number six, were you afraid at any point in time, either during the proceedings or after the verdict, were you afraid for your safety? No, um, not until after the verdict, of course. But when we made our verdict, we were given the facts, the laws, and the evidence to go by. We were not 
worried about what the mob rule was. That wasn't our job. Um, as far as Norman Rosenbaum is concerned, thinking about what repercussions might occur in the community, that was not part of what our verdict was. Well, that how wasn't did you, what we were charged to do. How did you feel when you saw what occurred the night of the verdict? Sick. Uh, I felt sick to my stomach that people would actually second guess a jury who was charged to do a particular duty and did it. I mean, America is one of the few, well, matter of fact, I can say it's the only country, I believe, that allows a person to be charged by their own peers. When all of that leaves, then we no longer have a democracy. Next, the prosecution tries to show that Yankel Rosenbaum is not just picking out anyone as his attacker. In fact, a suspect, another one, is released because Rosenbaum says he's not the one. What happened next while you were at that intersection? It was a, uh, another male brought up to the uh, car. Do you know his name? No, sir, I don't. Can you describe this individual? It was a uh, young uh, male black, about 14 or 15, about 5'4", sort of on the uh, chunky side. And do you recall who, if anyone, came up with this uh, individual to the intersection? My partner did, uh, Officer Price. And what happened at that time? I asked Mr. Rosenbaum if he recognized uh, him. When you say him, who are you referring to? I just asked to keep your voice up. The uh, person that uh, my uh, partner brought up. This is the young kid on the chubby side? Yes. And what, if anything, did uh, Yonka Rosenbaum say at that time? He said, uh, no, no, no. Did you ask Yonka Rosenbaum anything else? If he was, uh, if this male was involved uh, with the, his stabbing. And what did Yonka Rosenbaum say? He said say? no. What was then done with respect to this uh, young male? He was released. What happened then? Mr. Rosenbaum had pushed himself off the hood of the car and had spit at Mr. Nelson and said, why did you stab me? And when you say he spit, uh, could you tell what came out of his mouth at that time? It appeared to be a wad of blood. That seems like a solid identification, but during a crucial part of the cross-examination, defense attorney Arthur Lewis shows that Rosenbaum may have assumed Nelson was his attacker because he saw police displaying the knife right next to the accused. After you were shown this knife, after you were shown this knife. Yes, sir. You. Yes. Did Mr. Rosenbaum spat this glob of blood at Larry McNelson? When Officer Hoppy showed me the knife? So after you saw the knife, did the spitting take place before you were shown the knife or after you were shown the knife or perhaps while you were shown the knife? After I had seen the knife. When you were shown this knife, how close was Yankee Rosenbaum to you? He was next to me. I was next to the car, and he was on the hood of the car. He was right next to you. No, he wasn't right next to me. I was next to the car, and he was on the hood of the car. Were you next to the car? I was next to the car. He was following you from Rosenbaum at the time of night or so. Three feet. About three feet. Juror number six, let me ask you about that moment when Yankel Rosenbaum identified Lemrick Nelson out at the scene here. Was Mr. Lewis, the defense attorney, able to convince you that, first of all, Rosenbaum might have seen the knife, and second of all, that that might have caused Rosenbaum to assume Lemrick Nelson was his attacker? Uh, first of all, let me tell you, um, you had to have been there to hear what we heard and see what we saw. It's not so much as Mr. Lewis convincing of us of anything as, in Arthur Lewis's words, you have to go to the record. Mm -hmm. You have the 911 police dispatch tape, I believe, which tells you exactly what went on from start to finish. Well, what did you see then in that dispatch tape? We heard in that dispatch tape what appears to be two show-ups of Limerick Nelson, where a police officer clearly says, bring the guy back down. And we believe that Limerick Nelson was that guy that they were referring to, or at least I believe. You're talking about a tape which has no mention of a red shirt 
whatsoever on it. And we're all, we were all wondering, where did the red shirt come into play? Well, it isn't just the murder weapon and the words of the dying victim that seem to implicate Lemrick Nelson. It is Nelson himself. Detective Edward Brown takes the witness stand. He says, Nelson confessed to everything. Now that I have advised you of your rights, are you willing to answer questions? And Mr. Nelson replied, yes. Now, what is the very next thing that you said to him after he said he agreed to interview with you? I said to Mr. Nelson, I want you to tell me everything that happened from the time you left your house tonight until the present. Well, how did Mr. Nelson respond at that time? He said, okay. What happened next? He then went, went into his state. Tell the jury what Mr. Nelson stated to you at that time. Mr. Nelson said that he, and this is his word, he was chilling in front of 455 Schenectady Avenue, which where his girlfriend Conda lived. And he was drinking a 40 ounce beer. He saw a bunch of ambulances going towards Kings County Hospital, and he decided to make an inquiry. He approached the policewoman, he asked her what happened, and she said that a Jewish guy had hit a black kid with a car. He then said he walked up Schenectady Avenue until he got to President, President and Brooklyn Avenue. At President and Brooklyn, he encountered a crowd. In the crowd, somebody chanted, there's a Jew, let's get the Jew. The crowd chased, and Mr. Nelson joined them. I asked Mr. Nelson then, did he chase the Jew because he was in fact a Jew? And he said, no, I just got it. I was very excited and I was a little high from the beer. He said the crowd caught up to Mr. Rosenbaum and they started hitting him. He said he then took out his knife and he cut him once in the left side. I said, what happened then? He said that uh, the cop, he saw the cops coming and he ran and the cops grabbed him at Brooklyn and Union Street. I said, what happened then? He said, the cop took the knife out of my pocket. I asked him, what happened then? He said, the cop brought me back and the Jew said that I was the one who stabbed him. Coming up next, the defense goes on the attack as Arthur Lewis suggests this confession may have been coerced. We'll be back in a moment. The Crown Heights verdict, a city torn, will return in a moment. And we're back moments ago. We heard about the Lemrick Nelson confession, but did Nelson really confessed. Did police lie about it, or was a confession obtained through intimidation? Perhaps they beat it out of him. Well, we pick up the testimony with a cross-examination of the detective who said he took the confession. Did you ask him whether or not he wanted a lawyer present? In his rights. He understood his rights? Yes. As far as you're concerned? Yes, sir. You knew he just came back from the hospital? Yes. You know the reason why he was at the hospital at that time? I was told he had an asthma attack. Did you receive any information that he was struck or beaten? None whatsoever. Mr. Lewis, this has been such a mystery, and, and without breaching any confidences, which I know you can't do between yourself and your client, uh, can you shed any light on what really happened out there uh, when this confession took place, alleged confession? You see out there, are you talking uh, in the precinct? Yes. They had, they had to change him to another precinct later on, I, I realize, it, just about in the middle of it. But when Detective Brown says he took this alleged confession, can you shed any light on it? Was it really a confession? Was it coerced, intimidated out of him? Well, you have to, Mr. Jarrett, let's look at the facts and let's look at the record. If you recall, you uh, have the tapes with respect to the testimony. My client, after being taken to Kings County Hospital after he suffered an asthma attack and his opposition that the asthma attack was brought on by a beating that he received in a precinct. He was discharged from Kings County Hospital approximately two, uh, 247 
Mm -hmm. And now we have him at approximately 3 a.m. at the 71st Precinct, now being questioned. You know, you're dealing with a youth who is 16 years of age, just turned 16 years of age. And under the circumstances, he, suffered, he was beaten, he suffered an asthma attack, he was within 15 minutes, had been released from Kings County Hospital. He's now being questioned uh, about the presence of a lawyer, a parent, or an adult who can advise him. Now, what do you think these circumstances amount to? Do you think he confessed to doing something he didn't do simply for fear of another beating? Uh, who said he confessed or made admissions? I'm, I'm just asking. I don't know that, that he has, did. I've that, been calling has, it an alleged confession, be, a confession. That has to be determined. If he did give a statement that implicated himself as the person wielding the knife, do you think he did so? Is it possible he did so simply out of fear of being beaten again? Again, I, I, I state what I said before. Did you look at the admissions? What did he admit to? He admitted that he stabbed Yanko uh, Rosenbaum in the front. <laughs> Was Yanko Rosenbaum stabbed in the front? Was he? So your answer, your answer would be yes. Clearly. For fear of another beating. No, no, that's not what I said. I even attacked the very existence of the admission. The admission that uh, allegedly was made by my client mm -hmm. was not in conformant with the physical evidence that we know of. We so know you think it. they just made it up? Police just made it up? Let's uh, look at it this way. Clearly, at that particular time, the police had reason to believe that Yanko Rosenbaum was stabbed in the front because of the nature of the bloodstains. Let me turn to juror number 12 right now. This alleged confession, confession, however it happened, what did you think of it, juror number 12? The confession? Um, Do you think it happened in the first place? Uh, well, we looked at the medical evidence and we saw that um, uh, not from what... Uh, yeah, uh, what's his name? Uh, Leonard Nelson himself uh, stated, but what the doctor said, there was a beating. There was a beating. They found some type of contusions or something on his chest. We read everything that we could in order to find the evidence. Uh, that's what we saw as far as the... Uh, see, it's very difficult for us to, cut, to tell you what went on because you're asking questions here and there. And it's, it's not, uh, you know, we'd like to be able to tell you what went on, and we, we're here to do that, but it's the way that you're asking questions. You're asking us uh, specifically about the, there, there are so many extenuating circumstances. You had someone who was uh, officers who were preparing a, uh, uh, what, a accommodation. They conspired to do this. They didn't see police officers. They didn't see spit. They didn't see anything. Then you had uh, Sergeant Wilson, whose testimony we couldn't hear because it was muted or something. And he, it was very, he's the one who, you know, his uh, veracity helped us to make a decision. He was the one who pointed out that these things did happen, that there was a knife, that there was something well, else. It's fair to say that you doubted the confession ever took place. Is that correct? Uh, you doubted the validity of the confession. Yeah, well, there was another test also. There was a picture in which uh, these uh, sergeants said that uh, Limerick Nelson was, a, I mean, it was a simple test of credibility. They said he wasn't crying, they were, he wasn't doing anything like that. And there he was on the picture, you know, the video, crying and, and, and shaking. I mean. And at least that created in your mind well, re reasonable again, doubt, didn't it? Again, credibility. Yeah. We're asking for simple credibility. And there was so little of it that you had to pick and choose what you had to believe because you don't know what what's going on here you had the uh, weapon disappearing for you know three days well we're going to shed it, some it more light on it at this point the prosecution rested its case the defense decided to begin its case once again arthur lewis attacks the confession with nancy casella on the witness stand he portrays his client as someone who was not really capable of understanding his rights, let alone the questions that were put to him by police. What, if any, is your connection with, you, with Lemberg Nelson? I was the, I am the supervisor of the program he attended at Paul Robeson High School. So they were Paul what? Robeson High School? Paul Robeson High School for Business and Technology. Is he, what program is he in? 
He was in a modified instructional services two program, which is a Ms. Ms. Two program. Ms. Two program. Stands for modified instructional services two, basic one, which means it's academically uh, diploma bound. We're not a vocational school. And uh, he was in that program, which is a small class setting for children with learning and behavior problems. Was he what, is, what can be considered a special education student? Yes. Do you have an educational problem? Yes. Do you also have a behavior problem? Yes. Do you know this of your personal knowledge or just looking at records? Personal knowledge. I know all of the students in my department. Are you aware of Lemmerick Nelson's citizenship? citizenship? Yes. Has he ever a record for being assaulted? No. Jackson. Assaulted. I'm sorry, I still don't get the word. Right? Assaulted. Sustained. Has he a record for being in fights with other students? No. Jackson. One sec. That's overruled. Has he been in fights with us? Though? No. To your knowledge, that is. I would know. That every fight would come to me. His educational level for mathematics, do you have any idea what it is? Uh, about five years below grade level. When you say five years below grade level, what do you mean? Uh, I don't see guy. I permitted this in, we had a discussion. I don't know what mathematics has to do. Well, I ask you the next question. I sustain the judge. His level for comprehension, understanding. Also, a bit seriously, below what is expected for someone his age. How far below? About five years. So, in other words, he's 16, he has a comprehension of an 11 year old? Is right, right. Mr. Lewis, let me ask you this. Was it your point here that uh, your client had been educated to the fifth grade level or had the mind of a fifth grader? And it, it may sound like a very subtle distinction, but it really is a major one. There are a lot of people who have nothing better than a, a third grade education, but are very intelligent, bright people who certainly understand questions that are put to them and can certainly understand what they're saying to others. His chronological age was 16 at the time of the uh, arrest in the trial. Clearly, it was brought out that his educational um, level was of a fifth year old, uh, fifth grade, 11 year old. Here's a, here's a uh, youth, couldn't give you the definition of prior. Well, I think there are a lot of adults that couldn't give the definition of prior as well, but there are. But, but there's a lot of, not a lot of adults that are on trial and being accused of making a uh, statement that this uh, fellow clearly could not have made. But, but clearly there are very intelligent people who don't have anything no beyond doubt about that, education. No doubt about that, Mr. Garrett, no doubt about it. Yeah. We have millionaires sure. that haven't been encumbered by college degrees either. Right. Or law degrees. Right. The fact of the matter is we're talking about a youth at this pre uh, present time being tried for a very serious charge. Well, there's a, que a question of whether or not he can comprehend uh, any uh, instructions given to him, or directions given to him, and whether or not, in fact, he made the statement. Well, let me put that to juror number six. Do you think he understood what was being put to him, those questions, his Miranda rights? Do you think he understood what he was saying to police? It is my belief that he didn't. Um, basically, after a year and a half, um, when the trial came up about and was gone through, he might have known what it meant after the trial and during the trial. I mean, you've been told your Miranda rights over and over again. Um, to the point where maybe you do know what they mean now, but at that time, no. It's my belief that he didn't understand it at all. All right. Coming up next, the dramatic closing arguments. We'll be back in just a moment. The Crown Heights verdict, a city torn, will return in a moment. If I could, I'd give you a more We time. come now to the end of the trial, a time when both sides have a chance to give closing arguments to the jury. The defense goes first. Arthur Lewis likens police to Keystone cops who are clumsy even in their lies. The prosecution would want to believe this is an open and shut case. Nothing of the sort. They'd want to believe that they caught 
my client with a smoking gun. Nothing of the sort. This show up was tainted from beginning to end. It doesn't take much imagination to see that something was wrong when they had this lad take his cap off. Did you in any way suggest to the victim that this man was your per the perpetrator, this lad was the perpetrator, and show him the knife? Oh, no. It never happened. It never happened. Yet, you get Sergeant Wilson stating he first saw the knife with an open blade being shown to him by Hoppy, Mark Hoppy. Go to the record. It was only after this knife was shown to Sergeant Wilson and go to the record, did Yanko Rosenbaum spat out at Leverick Nelson and then say, why did you cut me? It was only after the knife was shown to Sergeant Wilson did Yanko Rosenbaum, according to Sergeant Wilson, spit a glob of blood on Lemmerich Nelson and then say, why did you cut me? The next witness, Robert Lewis from the Transit Police, who followed Litwin, blew this case out as far as I'm concerned. Why they didn't hold all of these lying son of a guns for perjury is beyond me. All of a sudden we hear that the transit cop went over the fence with Hoppy. Now is Hoppy blind? Is Marinos blind? Or are they lying? And if they're lying, and lying to the degree that they have done, then somebody should have seriously considered perjury. And I suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, that if this lad willingly made admissions, then why wasn't a statement signed? Why wasn't there an audio tape? Or why didn't he make the admission on the videotape? This case couldn't have been messier if they intended it to be. What they're going to say, well, if it was packed, if we were manufacturing the case, would it have been better? It should have been better. But these people in their arrogance, and their high-handedness didn't feel that it had to be any better than what it was. And what they felt was merely an assault escalated to a homicide. And you've got some damn dumb cops. Now I'll tell you this. They talk about the gang that couldn't shoot straight. you got a bunch of cops that can't even lie straight. Now I'm going to ask you, like the prophet, when he says, as a tree planted by the water, you shall not be moved. And I want you, if you believe in your heart, that the prosecution has failed to prove their case. And like that tree standing by the water, don't be moved. They've got to convince each and every one of you, each and every one of you, that they approved their case beyond a reasonable doubt, I can't see how you can do it. They have not done it because they have lied in this case from beginning to end. And I think they have tried to play people for being foolish. <clears throat> so I'm going to ask you. Deliberate. Look at the record. Take your time. And give not only Lembrick Nelson, but Yanka Rosenbaum and the people of the city of New York some justice. Let them see that we're not anybody's fool. That we'll fight against odds, we'll look for the truth, and we want justice. And I'm sure there's only one verdict you're going to get here. Not verdict, not guilty. We're going to release this lad, send him home where he belongs, and let's get on with it. Thank you. What about the other side? Prosecutor Sari Kolach delivers an equally powerful summation of the case. She says, if you believe no one else in this trial, believe the man who was attacked, believe Yankel Rosenbaum, who picked out his killer before he died. Who's the best witness to a murder case? The victim. 
The victim is always going to be present Dom? at the scene of his own murder. The victim is always, particularly in a stabbing, going to be closest to his murderer. And the victim, more than anybody, is always going to want the person that committed the murder, the correct person that committed the murder, to be caught. Who is the one witness, by the very definition of murder, will you never have in a murder case? The victim. But well, ladies and gentlemen, during this trial, you have had the opportunity to hear from one of the most valuable witnesses you could ever hope to hear from in a murder trial. Because through the, the statements that Yanko Rosenbaum made at the scene of his attack, at the scene of his own murder, through those statements in which he identified Lambert Nelson, Yanko Rosenbaum, in effect, became a witness at the trial of his own murder. Who is the next best witness to a murder case, ladies and, ge ladies and gentlemen? The murderer. Because just like the victim, the murderer is always going to be present at the scene of a murder he commits. The murderer is always going to know, better than anybody, why he committed the murder. He's going to know how he committed the murder. And during the course of this trial, ladies and gentlemen, through the statement that Lemrick Nelson made to Detective Abraham and Detective Brown, you had the opportunity to hear from the murderer. So you have heard from the two best witnesses you could ever hear from in a murder trial. You heard from the victim and you heard from the murderer. And ladies and gentlemen, I submit that that evidence in and of itself is proof beyond a reasonable doubt of the defendant's guilt. So the evidence you have is him running from the scene. You have him with the knife in his pocket. You have him with blood on his knife. You have the, have the blood consistent with the victim. You have the victim identifying him. You have the defendant admitting to the stabbing. And ladies and gentlemen, that is not only proof beyond a reasonable doubt, that is overwhelming evidence. Mr. Lewis has stood up here and outright accused the police officers of lying. Now let's face it, folks, there are inconsistencies in this case. Now, if they're lying, you wouldn't have it. When people are going to get together and tell a lie for the sole purpose of framing someone for a crime they didn't commit, for pinning something on them, when they get together and tell a lie, they make sure that there are no inconsistencies because they don't need to rely on their memories. They get together, they make up a nice, neat, simple little story, and that's it. It's only when people are relying on their memories, on what they recall occurring, that you're going to get these inconsistencies. In fact, I submit that if these officers had come in here and all told the exact same story, then you would have a reason to worry. It is precisely the presence of these inconsistencies that proves that they're not lying. When the defendant took his knife out of his pocket and unfolded it and joined, in, joined together with that crowd and plunged that knife into Yanko Rosenbaum's body, he was accepting responsibility, ladies and gentlemen, not only for his own actions, but for the actions of the people he was acting together with. And there can be no question in your mind what his intent was when he opens that knife and plunges it into another human life. And you can't really sit here and say, look, he's just a kid. He just got caught up in things. He didn't start it. He just joined in with the other people. Because ladies and gentlemen, some things cannot be forgiven. He took another human life. It can't be repaired. It can't be replaced. It can't be overlooked. It can't be excused. And what I am asking you to do now is to hold Lemrick Nelson responsible for his actions. Hold him responsible for the senseless taking of Yanko Rosenbaum's life. Thank you. Is Lemrick Nelson innocent? 
Well, we may never know the answer to that question, but we do know that the jury found him not guilty, and there's a difference there. They found reasonable doubt, at least in their own minds, that he committed the crime for which he was charged. Juror number three, let me ask you, what was the reasonable doubt in your mind? Well, there are so many of them. For, in the, um, first with Officer Hoppe, at the time he apprehended Mr. Nelson, with, along with Mr. with Officer Lewis, he said he found the the bloody knife in Mr. Lewis, in uh, Mr. Nelson's pocket, and and um, there was no blood in his hand. There was no blood in the pocket, and he put the bloody knife in his pocket. Then at the show up to, when he brought Mr. Nelson to um, to to Mr. Rosenbaum at the show up. In, uh, he took the um, Mr. Nelson hat off his head and showed him to Mr. Rosenbaum. I mean, if you're going to show um, for somebody to identify somebody in a crime, you got to show it at uh, exactly how the person was, what they were dressed in, and everything that they had on at the same time. Let me switch to juror number six. J juror number six, what do you take away from this experience? In other words, if you had to, if you had to go give a talk to a mostly a white, mostly Jewish high school, uh, what would you say about the system now and your experience in it? The system as a whole, um, my experience has been, I, I did my civic duty. Um, the system as a whole is set up to provide many fail-safes, as I said, the prosecution, the judge, and the defense were able to interview us each and every one of us individually where they knew exactly what they were getting when they chose the jury as a whole. Um, it's as fair and as reasonable as can be. You have to look at what is the evidence given to you. The defendant is brought to you innocent until proven otherwise. And if there's a reasonable doubt then he has to be given the benefit of the doubt because he isn't being proven guilty beyond, that's the key word, beyond a reasonable doubt. What, what was the reasonable doubt in your mind? Were there just so many of them? Uh, was there one predominant doubt as, uh, as to the confession, for example, or was it the identification? What was it that was the most doubtful in your mind? The most doubtful was Okay, the confession was hearsay because that took place between the detective and Limerick Nelson. Mm -hmm. The most doubt between, in my mind, is the fact that the knife itself was never sent for testing. They were sent cotton swabs for testing, which uh, tells me a whole lot about how the police precinct does procedures. Mm -hmm. If Limerick Nelson's clothes, his socks, I mean, even the shoes were sent for testing, why wasn't this knife, which was the key piece of evidence, sent for testing? How can Ms. Kolach say that there was a bloody knife when the knife itself was not tested? Juror number 12, uh, some has been written about a get-together between the defense attorney, Arthur Lewis, who's sitting here next to me, and the jurors a day or so after uh, this verdict took place. Uh, a dinner, drinks, what was going on there? Uh, we were... When we spoke to Mr. Lewis, we told him that we wanted New York City to know how we arrived at this particular verdict so that they would know that justice was served. When we came there, we were surprised to find what was going on. It was probably, he was, he was kind enough to invite us, but I, I believe what it was was you know, basically a, a party or, well, not, not a party, but a get-together of those people who were involved in the defense. Okay. Uh, so, but during that period of time, I talked to a lot of people and I got a lot of information. I spoke to newspaper reporters who agreed that acquittal, the ones who actually saw the whole testimony agreed. Uh, from New York Times, from Newsday, they agreed that, yeah. uh, that there was reasonable doubt. Just I've got to, I've got to cut you off there. I'm sorry. Thank you. And he also Thank you all of the that. participants uh, in Thank you for all of our participants being involved tonight, to the two gentlemen to my right and the jurors. Special recognition certainly has to go to the jurors who came forward. They had a very difficult task in deciding this case. And from everything that we have heard, their only goal was to seek the truth, to follow the law.
And at a time when people all over New York are raising their voices at each other, we wanted to give a voice to the jurors. And it's our hope that the people of New York, indeed the country, were listening. For Court TV and New York One News, I'm Greg Jarrett.